did change my, the title of my talk a little bit. It was selected from a poster, and you can get away with a little bit more in a poster with, about, uh, uh, with titles. You know, uh, I, I, I'm not quite to the genotype by environment interactions work yet, but we've been doing some work uh, mostly starting with populous deltoides in the eastern U.S. about three years ago on um, the factors, the soil factors and plant factors that may be affecting the distribution of the populous microbiome and, and the root-associated populous microbiome. So this uh, started off, like I said, about three years ago as part of a larger effort at Oak Ridge um, where we brought a bunch of projects together um, to, under a common theme, what we call a scientific focus area. And we chose to work on the plant microbe interface as part of that focus area, uh, take advantage of the tremendous uh, abilities and the group uh, on plant genomics led by Jerry Tuskin at Oak Ridge and some of the microbial, microbiologists at Oak Ridge and ecologists, including myself, got to participate. Um, so as part of this, um, we, we really focus in on two different uh, parts of, 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 uh, of this overall project. But what I'm going to talk about today is really part of the first aim of this project, which is to try to understand natural systems. And then the, the second part of the project is really looking at detailed genome-based interactions and signaling between microbes, plants, and microbes and microbes within the rhizosphere microbiome. And what the interface between these is our natural system studies also provide isolates that are, that are then looked at for different signaling mechanisms in the, in, the, in the second part of the project. And this is a large-scale collaboration led by Oak Ridge, but including uh, universities and participants elsewhere. Um, so for about three years now, we've been looking at uh, populous deltoides populations in the eastern U.S., and we've been looking in natural riparian systems and really looking at broad-scale associations of, and microbiome patterns within these environments. Um, so, and even though this is a metagenomic session, I, I'm not really... There's no shotgun metagenomics in this talk. It's all going to be about ribosomal RNA community patterns. So in any case, um, so we've been working on that about three years. I'm going to tell you a couple of little stories about that. And then our new projects that are starting with JGI are associated with populous trichocarpa common gardens on the, in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, those I'll give you a few slides at the end tell you what our plans are. The sequences are just now coming back, and so I'm not really going to show you any data from that. So our first campaign that we worked on um, looking at um, populations in these systems was to really look at, um, we really wanted to focus in on the endos endosphere of the root, the, the, the microbes living within the root. <clears throat> and there's been several theories about how those organisms get there beyond, beyond the rhizobia that you heard about this morning. Um, but some, some folks uh, seem to appreciate that these may be specialized or obligate relationships, or they may be very opportunistic, just organisms that got trapped sort of accidentally in the root as it grows through the soil, and some persist, some don't. Um, but these would uh, set up different types of patterns that we might expect to see within the root microbial community. And so in our first... Uh, studies that we started in 2009, we looked at just two different uh, soils about, or two different stands of poplar deltoides about a mile apart, upland and bottomland locations, and tried to contrast um, to get an idea what, what the endosphere looks like compared to the rhizosphere. Um, and this was led by a student, uh, actually a post-bachelor's student, just finished his bachelor's and came in as an intern for a year, did a lot of the work on this. He's now a grad student at Texas A&M. And I have pictures, try to put pictures in through the, through the whole thing of folks that contributed. Um, so for that study, the, the long and short of it was these microbial communities between the endosphere and rhizosphere, just millimeters apart from the same root, are quite different. So even though the rhizosphere is presumably the source of the endosphere, there's very uh, little overlap in taxa. So on a whole community basis, Looking at both bacteria and fungi, we see um, these less variable systems here are the rhizosphere samples originating from both upland and bottomland locations. Um, and in both bacteria and fungi, they're more tightly grouped than the endosphere samples. 
um, which are more widespread, but they're clearly distinct from one another. Even on an OTU level basis, you see individual OTUs that are prominent in either the endosphere or the rhizosphere rarely overlap. You see a lot of organisms that seem to be very specialized. Uh, you do see some violations of that rule, of course, especially more prominent seem to be in the fungi. Um, okay, uh, what else do I want to say? Oh, this is, so that we, we take this sort of approach on a lot of our studies is we, we do everything in parallel with bacteria and fungi, try to look at some of the total communities. So in Populus deltoides, again, after that first study, we had some remaining questions. We didn't, we really only looked at two soil types and we wanted to understand just how variable these communities were across a broader portion of uh, a broader set of conditions with Populus deltoides. So we took on uh, the next year a, a larger scale study where we looked at two different watersheds in Tennessee and North Carolina. We've got Tennessee orange here and Duke Blue Devil blue for some of our collaborators. Um, but uh, so these are separated by um, the Appalachian range here and this in, in green is the range of Populus deltoides. Um, so we wanted to look at the effects um, of seasonal um, effects on these populations. So we looked at both spring and fall, geographic effects. We were looking also at, we used SSR genotyping to type uh, the host populations of, of these, uh, tr of the trees. And we wanted to represent, in general, a broad range of conditions. It's not quite as broad of, uh, of range as what we just saw across the Isthmus of Panama in phosphorus and pH, but it is a fairly broad range of conditions. So in this, we saw soil. This is one example of how those things vary in those two different populations. So soil texture varies greatly from very sandy soils, um, soils that were almost pure sand. It was basically a sandbar and uh, there are things that are more clay rich. We saw the genotypes actually between the two populations separated quite distinctly between Tennessee and North Carolina. We saw um, what appear to be over 20 SSR um, loci to be fairly uh, homogenous uh, genotype or perhaps even a clone uh, along the Caney Fork River that took a lot of our genetic variation away in these populations. Oops. So within that, we did see, again, this, this divide between the, the endosphere population, or the endosphere populations and the rhizosphere populations. We saw very, um, uh, the, the groupings varied also by, you know, the, the watershed of origin. So um, the blue uh, duke, uh, North Carolina and uh, Tennessee uh, orange. Um, we also see within the rhizosphere, although they're less variable, they're more diverse within the rhizosphere, but they're less variable from sample to sample. And we see the, this same divide between, um, between North Carolina and Tennessee. We also see some, you can see the separation between the seasons, between the open and the closed circles um, in both Tennessee and North Carolina. So we do see seasonal effects And we've tried to account for all the variation in the systems and partition that variation according to different categories uh, of, of, that we measured. So we can look at, again, both within the fungi and the bacteria. Um, we could, within the fungi, we could account between the measured variables that are underlie each of those categories for about 63% or so of, or 56% or so of the, um, variation in the, in the rhizosphere microbiome or the endosphere microbiome. The bacteria, we did less well. But within that overall community level patterns, for certain phyla and dominant OTUs, we see highly significant um, uh, interactions with individual variables or, or a time period of sampling. So for example, within the endosphere, and this has been shown in Dangle's group and others too, um, the actinobacteria and the proteobacteria seem to be very important groups, and specifically streptomyces-like organisms, pseudomonas-like organisms tend to dominate in these samples um, within the root. And we can see a very significant shift 
um, from the streptomyces like actinobacteria and, um, and being dominant in the fall to the, the proteobacteria, pseudomonas like organisms being dominant in the spring in these systems. And real fairly quickly, since there's not much data in this anyway, um, we, we are uh, now looking at common garden populations in the northwest. Um, these are um, a thousand different genotypic variants of Populus trichocarpa that were collected several years ago by Jerry Tuscan's group and brought into common garden, propagated, replicated, and brought into common gardens. Um, there's actually four common gardens. We've just looked at two so far. Um, these have been completely resequenced by JGI to at least a 12x step. So here we have a chance to look at GWAS interactions with microbiome populations, and this is pretty exciting. So J as part of our CSP project, JGI is, is doing our microbiome analysis of this, um, doing the sequencing. So we chose four traits, and since we can't sample the entire GWAS population of 1,000 sets of roots, uh, it takes too long. It's not as easy as collecting leaves. Uh, we, um, we chose to sample some extreme phenotypes and genotypes within the population. So, for example, uh, looking at the, the population level variation of S to G ratio in lignin, we chose to sample several, eight different extreme genotypes. Um, but if you also then map the, where these other extreme, we picked extreme genotypes for plant growth pathogen susceptibility as well, and you map where those fall, like on the lignin, you get a pretty good sampling of the, of the bell-shaped curve. Um, so as, as I said, JGI has graciously agreed to help us out on the sequencing for this. We are um, doing a combination of large-scale ribosomal RNA community pro profiling um, using the MySeq platform. Um, so we're looking at 32 different genotypes. Um, that are replicated um, at two locations. Um, we ended up with around 500. Some of them weren't alive, so we ended up with around 550 samples or so, um, and those are being profiled with ribosomal RNA. From those, we will select one of the most, some of the most extreme vari variants in the population and the microbiome that we observe for um, in-depth metagenomic profiling of the rhizosphere. And just very quickly, um, we've uh, to sort of get to that components level, some of the genomes and organisms that we've isolated from these environments. Um, so there's a lot of collaborators involved in this, but we've isolated over 2,800 bacteria and 900, ooh, boy, they really want me out of here. 2,800 bacteria and 900 fungi from these systems over the last few years. Uh, recently, uh, last year, we sequenced about 43 bacterial isolates with a focus on the pseudomonas to get sort of a, a local scale um, pan genome associated with just a few roots of populus, and then also uh, some isolates that are in various stages at JGI. These pseudomonas are interesting. They're all 1 OTU by 16S, but they vary quite, quite widely in characteristics. So some of these came from the same tree, so B1B being the same tree here. And you can see most of these are from the bottom in sight, which was the B. Some of them produce antimicrobials, some don't. Some have quorum sensing activity, some don't. Some have siderophores, well, they all have siderophores, they're pseudomonas. But uh, they, some uh, have phosphatase activity, some don't. And so even within what would be called a one OTU, or one species, there's quite wide variation. And Recently, we started to compare some of our isolate collection with that of the group at UNC, uh, Jeff Dangle's lab. Uh, and I, use, I see Sir in the background here, in the back row or <laughs> close there. But anyway, uh, Sir took all of our, a uh, portion of our isolates and compared them with the isolates that they have in their collection. And we see a lot of the same groups, whether you're looking at Populus or Arabidopsis, um, as, as being important in our isolate collections. Um, Sometimes there are different variants, but they don't seem to overlap very much between the two collections. Other times, you see, uh, you know, on the same branch, these are very similar organisms that are occurring in these collections. And I'm just going to conclude with that and acknowledge um, my lab and several of these folks that moved on. 
but also other ORNL collaborators, collaborators at Duke, our new collaborators at JGI that we're excited to work with, and uh, a collaborator at NRA. Thank you. <laughs>